Hello, people. I've got a really fun job today. This guitar was made in Kalamazoo, Michigan, 1961. And it's in for a neck reset. How do you know when you need a neck reset? Well, this string, these strings don't even have tension on them. And you can see that the neck has the wrong angle going. And it, it's actually loose. It's, it's very loose. It's actually still attached to the binding, so I want to make sure I separate the binding before I separate the neck entirely. Now, last year I did a video of a um, ES125 TC that only had the neck pickup. It didn't. It wasn't a TCD. I guess dual maybe was the, what the D stood for. And uh, this customer found me on YouTube and brought me the guitar. Coincidentally, he's down here in Nashville, too. Um, but the difference is going to be this time, I'm going to separate the fretboard from the spacer instead of separating the spacer from the body. So, thanks for tuning in and watching along. This one should be real fun. Only a Gibson is good enough. I took the neck pickup out and wanted to look down inside the body. Well, I got a mirror. There you can see the neck block. And it's my belief that the neck and the top have a small separation. I'm going to need to try to get some glue in there before I put string tension back on this guitar. And the reason I was, I was clued into that is because of this. That little visor right there. The top cracked from the forces of string tension. Preparing to heat the fretboard extension with the heat lamp, I use aluminum foil over cardboard to protect the lacquer from the heat. I also like to swing the lamp around so that all of the heat doesn't just concentrate into one single area. This is Mylar. It keeps the knife from scratching the lacquer surface. When I inject the steam into the neck pocket, you can see that it's shooting out the hole on the treble side of the 14th fret slot and it's also shooting out the side of the neck joint to body. That's not good so I want to wipe that up with a rag. Before I started steaming I stuffed some paper down inside of the guitar body to keep the pickup from wiggling around and scratching and getting desoldered. This time I'm using a dowel inserted into the hole in the 14th fret on the treble side so that when the steam goes in, it stays in. There's a lot of moisture collecting in and around the side, so I'm going to wipe that up. I'll steam, and then I'll wipe. Then I'll repeat until the neck joint comes loose. It took a little more steaming than I thought. I had to kind of coerce it. You want to see the dovetail? I've got to take this off. That'll be the next step. Because that's a serious, that's a serious little takeoff it's doing right there. And it'll stay like that until I take this off, and then usually it relaxes and straightens out. It's more dramatic if you look at it this way. And then when you put like a straight edge on it, boy oh boy, that's wax that I, I started putting wax around the um, guitar body and stuff while I'm 
well, before I start running the steamer, I, I put this wax on there. And I kind of think it helps from keeping the lacquer from blushing. Anyways, I haven't had any serious blushing issues since I started waxing. Look closely here. The neck block is made of plywood. It just doesn't seem like good practice. On all the acoustic guitars with dovetails, they have a solid wood neck block, but I mean, this is plywood. So, I mean, are you a little surprised? Maybe, oh, there's that binding piece. That binding piece, um, I did remember to unglue it from the neck before I steamed. But yeah, tell me your thoughts on a plywood neck block. Maybe this is why the joint is so weak. But the guitar looks pretty good already. It uh, didn't blush horribly. And whenever it does blush, I can always buff the, the white. That's blushing, that little white ghosty looking stuff. Cloudy. Cloudy stuff. All right. This one has a stinger. It's a little bit off-center. It's a little bit that way, I don't know. Pretty interesting. I always thought those were interesting. So now i got to unglue this part. Okay. He was using this little heat blanket. And I was using this heat lamp. It took about 20 minutes. And this is the big reveal. There it is. I got it off in one piece. Only problem is part of the dovetail ended up here in these two corners. See the little, it's loose right there, so good thing that never gets seen. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm glad this came apart in one piece and there's no visible, you know, the first time I did one of these, these two pieces got, they seemed like they were already separated from a previous job, but I'm not too sure about that. Anyhow, this one's intact. I'm going to save these little pieces of mahogany. And um, once again, this is a piece of maple, I believe. Yeah, that's maple, mahogany, rosewood. So we got all these different woods intersecting with each other. And then the actual neck block is a piece of plywood. Craziness. Crazy. So I've got the fretboard extension supported down here and this bag of sand weighing down above it, above the heel, so that as it cools, it will create, hopefully it'll, it'll cool off and there'll be a little bit of fall away at the end of the fretboard instead of that ski jump. Giving this new workstation a go. It's called a Tech Deck. It comes from Ontario, Canada. It's a string tech workstation. So like I was saying before, as soon as I un unglued this maple spacer, the fingerboard extension, which was like that, flipped right back to a straight position and then I undercut the dovetail with a Japanese saw and clamped it down to the bench. I, I remember filming that, but today it's in an almost fall away position. So um, success right there. There was a couple pieces of the dovetail that were still glued into this little corner area, which I um, was able to heat and remove from this piece and glue back into the proper space here on the dovetail. 
I'm chiseling the inside area of the heel, making sure not to touch the outside perimeter. This is what they call undercutting with a chisel. That way when I'm ready to fine tune sand the outside edges of the heel, I can do so without all this extra material in my way. The Stumac guitar repair vise really helps me hold the neck into different positions while I'm working on this and it holds it really nice and steady, which is important. But I was on a Zoom call with some other repair techs and someone was actually, I wish I caught his name, hopefully talk to him again today, but he was working on the same guitar. He had the neck off and we were kind of comparing things. And the thing that he did that I did not do was as soon as the neck came off, he was prepared and he went ahead and clamped everything back into place. Cause you know, this plywood neck block is once the heat gets in there, it's definitely going to delam. So that all that old high glue is already soft and heated. Clamp it up. What I did wrong is I waited. I don't know why I just decided it's going to be better if I go ahead and wait and then re-glue everything. But what happens? What happened when I did that was there was probably some hardened hide glue pieces here and there inside these laminations. And when I glued it and clamped it, it couldn't clamp completely back into a position. So there's a small gap right here, less than a sixteenth of an inch, but that has to be taken care of now. It's good over here. Well, no, we still got a little lump. There's a little lump right here that I'm going to take out. Down here at the... There's a little hump, and that's starting to go away. Once I decide which tool works the best here, that I should make pretty quick work out of this. Just get a little bit of three-in-one oil, sewing machine oil on there. This is my diamond file. Little bit of fish glue. One thing to be mindful of for sure is that they face glue the neck heel onto the face here. And uh, before you even start doing any kind of ungluing, I'd go around it with a little Japanese saw like this and just kind of cut through that glue line. You know, go around the back like that, come in from both sides, just cut that old glue line. That way the you don't have as much damage as I did this time but all the damage is fixed up um, laid in a little color and a little lacquer here that's still a little cloudy but when it cures I'll uh, buff that out and it should go together great here I'm fitting the neck onto the body 
and clamping it in place, taking the neck back out, and seeing the little black lines that are left by the carbon paper inside. Sneaking up on a good fit. You wiggle the neck back out of the neck pocket and the carbon paper is stuck to either side of the dovetail. I put the neck back on the bench, take the carbon paper off, and scrape away or whittle away the black lines that were left by the carbon paper. I end up putting the neck on and taking it off the body about a dozen to twenty times on average when I'm doing a neck reset. Then I strap the guitar body down onto that GPS Tech Deck workstation, string it up with a, the outside strings. See there's a clamp, a bar clamp holding the neck on into the body there. And that gives me a good idea of what my string action is going to be. I set the relief at this point and make sure that we're looking at a guitar that's going to be in its final shape. Here it is guys. The moment of truth. My favorite glue. Fish glue. It has a nice long open time. So there's really no reason to panic. Although I usually do. That's it, a little bit of glue. So what I have between the 12th fret and the 21st fret is uh, quite a bit of fall away, a little bit too much. What I'd like to see is 4 64ths here and 5 64ths here. So I've created these small wedges that I will glue inside with some fish glue. They are one and a half millimeters on this side, tapered down to zero millimeters over here. So those will be placed inside, underneath the uh, fingerboard extension and the maple spacer. Says this, this is still loose, I haven't glued it down yet. Um, and this will be touched up too. I'll show you a little bit of that touch up work. These little fingertip lights came in handy. Getting those wedges in there without pushing them in too far is really um, tricky because most of the lighting's coming from above. Well, these little fingertip lights let me kind of shoot the light in from the side and uh, see what, just what I'm doing. Now I've got two cam clamps holding that down and uh, we'll let that glue cure for about six hours. And the last thing we'll do is put that fret in. Here we go, looking at those two pieces. Half inch plywood with cork or leather um, prevent the uh, clamps from damaging the back of a guitar. This is the area on the base side that I'm working on today. I decided it's such a small, minute area, I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, showing what I'm doing here, but there is this small spot. I'm going to fill that in and put some clear lacquer over the top of it. We'll see how it turns out.
1966 Pontiac GTO. One of my favorites. It's funny to think this guitar was only four years old, five years old when these GTO's models came off the line. Love that car. So the moment has come. A couple days ago I brushed lacquer in around these areas and there was one spot in particular around this binding here that I might have to wet sand. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to wet sand that bumpy spot and then I'll rub that out with the Meguiar's Ultimate Compound and Ultimate Polish and we'll take a look at her. Let's see what it looks like right now before. This is the area. I gooped down a bunch of finish so we're going to wet sand, level sand, and polish. I can't even remember. Okay, it's, yeah, that area. All wet sanded and polished up. Yeah. I put a little coat of wax on her too. That seemed to work real good as that uh, Meguiar's cleaning wax. Let's see what she sounds like. Seven and I do as a doggone please. There ain't 